Welcome to Author Stories, the podcast where we talk to the best writers in the industry and discuss writing and the creative process. Whether you're a writer, a reader, or both, we hope you'll find something here that makes you love books and the writers that create them. You can find archives of all of the great conversations I've had with authors over the years at hankgarner.com. Take some time and browse around there. I'm sure you'll find a new author to love, find inspiration for your own creative life, and find a new story to get lost in. Let's thank some sponsors who make the show possible. Jasper T. Scott. His box set, Dark Space, the complete series. This is six books bundled together on sale now for 99 cents. Six complete books, over 600,000 copies sold. More than 2,000 pages of epic space opera for the low price of 99 cents. Also available in Kindle Unlimited if you're a Kindle Unlimited subscriber. Humanity is defeated. Ten years ago, the Scythians invaded the galaxy with one goal, to wipe out the human race. Now the survivors are hiding in the last human sector of the galaxy, dark space. Once a place of exile for criminals, now the last refuge of mankind. The once galaxy-spanning Imperium of Star Systems is left guarding the gate, which is the only way in or out of dark space. But not everyone is satisfied with their governance. Freelancer and ex-convict Ethan Ortain is on the run. He owes crime lord Alec Barandi 10,000 souls, and his ship is badly damaged. When Brandi catches up with him, he makes an offer Ethan can't refuse. Ethan must infiltrate and sabotage the Valiant, the Imperial Star System's fleet carrier which stands guarding the entrance of dark space, and then his debt will be cleared. While Ethan is still undecided about what he'll do, he realizes that the Imperium has been lying and putting all of Dark Space at risk. Now Brondi's plan is starting to look like a necessary evil, but before Ethan can act on it, he discovers that the real plan was much more sinister than what he was told, and he will be lucky to escape the Valiant alive. Grab all six books for 99 cents right now. Dark Space, the complete series by Jasper T. Scott. The Unwelcome Trilogy by R.D. Brady, Survivor, Mother, Leader, and Humanity's Last Chance. Deep within the remnants of the United States, Lila Richards oversees a camp of 200 survivors. In a world where living is an everyday struggle, and only through banding together can people survive, the arrival of the Unwelcome only made her job harder. Riley Quinn and Miles Jones have been raised by Lila for the last five years. They're also one of the cursed, the children between the ages of 13 and 18, whom the unwelcome kill on sight. No questions, no pleas, just death. Protecting one another and the people of their camp is ingrained in all of them, but now each of them faces increased danger as the reason why the cursed have been targeted by the unwelcome slowly comes to light, and that truth will shock them to their core. Now time is running out, not just for the cursed who are being hunted down by the unwelcome, not just for Lila and her family who will face the greatest challenge yet, but for all of humanity. The world changed radically 35 years ago, but today humanity's very existence is on the line, and the fight has begun that will ensure its future or its annihilation. Fans of A.G. Riddle, James Rollins, Suzanne Collins, and Brandon Sanderson will love the Unwelcome Trilogy. Pick up your copy of the Unwelcome Trilogy on Amazon today. Edge of Valor, a military sci-fi thriller by Josh Hayes. When their mission fails, his begins. David Weber calls it a tour de force. Special Agent Jackson Fisher is a man after truth. When a military operation to extract a high-ranking ambassador from the war-torn border world of Stonemeyer ends in disaster, Fisher is called in to investigate. A whole platoon went in, but only three Alliance Marines returned home. The rest killed in action along with hundreds of civilians. With tensions between the Holloman Alliance and Stonemeyer rising, Fisher attempts to stitch the pieces together. One thing becomes more and more certain. The surviving Marines are lying. As the truth unfurls, Fisher begins to realize this was far more than a simple rescue mission and that the truth might be something best left buried. Filled with action, mystery, and well-crafted characters, Edge of Valor... The Valor series, Book 1, will put you into a world of war, conspiracy, and betrayal. It's perfect for fans of David Weber's Honorverse or Tom Clancy's Jack Ryan with a futuristic flair. 
That's Edge of Valor by Josh Hayes. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to be joined by Gail Woodson, Dr. Gail Woodson. Uh, She has a fantastic new book. It's called After Kilimanjaro, and this is uh, is a fantastic book, Gail. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, Welcome to the show. Well, thank you, and I'm glad you enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun for me to write it. Yeah, it's I can imagine. It it really comes through in the pages. You know, you can tell when something was written with joy and uh it 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 bleeds into the pages. Um but before we get to talking about all that good stuff, uh we begin each show with the same question and that question is what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, I, I can't remember the precise time, but I used to make um little newspapers that told the, this, the news stories in my family. And I'd make little books, and I bound them with pink yarn. And uh, I recently found a copy of one of the editions of my newspaper, and the headline was that my cat Midnight had just had kittens. And I think I was six years old then, and I, I said I was excited, I-C-K-S-I-D. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that so much. <laughs> Oh, that's fantastic. Um, with If you were writing and binding your own books and writing a newspaper for the family, um, did uh, what was your family's response to that? Uh, did they encourage you in that? Did they, did they notice that you know, little Gail has a knack for this? Well, they saved the little paper, obviously. <laughs> I, I found it in the house when my, after my father passed away. He saved a bunch of those little things, and they, they were behind pretty much anything I wanted to do. Except, except when I was a little girl, I wa- said I wanted to be a doctor like my dad, and my parents always said, oh, yeah, you can do whatever you want. But everybody else would say, oh, you mean you want to be a nurse? Because this was in the 50s, and I, I didn't even know any lady doctors i knew one lady doctor and uh she had you know given up practice to stay home with her kids so i thought okay i won't be a doctor um so being a writer sounded like a good thing oh wow my my mother was uh was a nurse uh until she passed and uh, she used to tell my sister and i the stories that she wanted to be a medical missionary and uh, wanted to be a doctor, and everyone told her the same thing, and she settled for being a nurse, and that was one of her greatest life's frustrations, I think. Um, you know, thank God the world has changed at least a little bit uh, from then to now. Oh, yes. So uh, were, were you a bookish kid? Uh, other than the writing, um, were, you, were you a big reader? Oh, yeah. I, I learned to read before I was, I think I was about four years old, reading, I, my uh, babysitter would read to me and I'd look over her shoulder. And um, so, yeah, I, I I was reading comic books when I was five and under the covers with a flashlight. I, you know, I grew up in a small town and uh, I don't know, I just really enjoyed reading about other places. That. Um, what was your first... Um experience with uh with writing something longer form uh than uh th- than the stuff you did as a kid hmm. in terms of like a novel or a, like a novel short story maybe yeah. just kind of stretching yourself and and feeling out those uh storytelling muscles yeah. well i mean i i wrote essays for my high school newspaper and i wrote you know, little poems. Um, I never really wrote a short story till till later, and I started uh, several novels. Beginning, you know, when I was in college, on I would start something and never quite finish it. Um, I used to I used to live um, in San Diego when I was uh, oh that was back in the uh, the nineties, and I would fly back and forth to Washington because I was on um, a national uh, an NIH committee, and so on the way across, I would work on all my work, and on the way back, I'd, I'd write, start on this novel. It was one of the first laptops you could get, and then that laptop crashed, and I lost the novel. So it was, so it was, but it's still in my head. I'm going to write it someday. But um, when I retired, actually, that's one of the novels I thought I was going to start on. But 
instead I was uh, I spent six weeks in Africa the, the uh, right after I retired because I'd been spending a couple of weeks there twice a year for a long time and and during that time this novel just came out it just I couldn't not write it um, I want to I want to really get into that in just a minute but the 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 novels that you started on and and never finished were they similar in subject or tone uh, to after Kilimanjaro or was this completely different this was completely different um, I wrote I would I would write things some one of them was about um, you know women's issues uh, uh, another one was kind of a murder mystery medical novel um, and you know things along along those lines I think my medical stuff always seeped into everything I wrote <laughs> <laughs> Um, you mentioned that you you visited Africa for a couple of weeks, a couple of times a year for a long time. What was that? Uh, what was the initial thing that drew you there? It was you know, medical outreach. I mean, I had gone, I'd done medical outreach in Central America and the Middle East. Um, you know, kind of what we call the hit and run trips, where you go in and do some cases and you come home. Um, I, I shouldn't say it's so denigrating, um, but it's. I didn't mean to make sound it like it was, but but um, in terms of having, going someplace and having a sustained impact, my husband and I went to this hospital and uh, at, just at the recommendation of a friend, and we found it was a place that really needed specifically what we could do. Um, we're ear, nose, and throat doctors, not like the person in my book, and there were only five ear, nose, and throat doctors in the whole country of Tanzania, and it's like 50 million people. So we realized that we could make a big difference by training. And there's, a, you know, we think about ENT, what does it mean? It's not just taking out tonsils. There's uh, a lot of diseases and tumors. And so we uh, started helping to train some uh, some doctors. We, you know, we're teaching medical students and then getting them interested and, in, you know, collaborated with some people from some other countries. And now we there's uh, three doctors that have become qualified that are now the teachers of some others. So, um we love going there. We just, you know, it's like our second home. Um, I recently went on a trip with my family, and we were driving through a national park. And uh, it, it was one of those experiences where as you drive through and you see new sites that you've never seen and you and you meet new people and you're having conversations that – that this the story starts forming uh, in your brain, and you start seeing possibilities of of, uh, of what a story could be, and uh, you're kind of feeding off of the atmosphere and the people. Uh, d- did you have a, an experience like that uh, first going to Africa, where um, you know your your imaginative self started kind of just playing out possibilities of of stories that could happen there? Absolutely, and. Um there are the stories I, around the hospital where I was, but um, I also visited uh, um, some pretty remote places, um, smaller villages, and seeing how little health care there was available there, and that's what really started drawing me into it. And, the, and then also just the, the, the beauty of the country, the physical beauty, uh, the wildlife, all, all those were things that I thought it would be wonderful to share because it, it just is such an amazing you know, place to be. Right. Um, it's easy to see, to, to think about the impact that, that you and your husband had. Um, and, and you talked about wanting to train people and, you know, how can we have the most impact in this place, uh, maybe even when we're not there. Um, but how do you feel like the place and the people impacted you? Oh, uh, I'm trying to think of where to start. Um, just the real commitment uh, of the the young doctors there to to learn the uh, the internet's made a huge difference uh, because we're only there maybe a couple months out of the year we have colleagues that go there but the students get together and teach themselves you know they'll they'll have a curriculum that we've kind of laid out and they go online and they look up everything and they teach each other it's, it's almost like the case-based learning that uh, was developed at um, Southern Illinois University or at Harvard you know back in the the 90s uh, and they've kind of learned that that system themselves um, and people just that are so happy with with not much uh, people that are so kind and ready to to help you it's um, 
it's a beautiful country. There's a uh, in in America or most of the the westernized world, uh, we think of our medical system uh, as very institutionalized, very. Um, uh, it's probably not a lot of off the wall innovation, uh, and, and please don't. Uh, I'm I'm definitely an outsider looking in. Uh, or but the, the, the medicine you're talking about, or well, that? well, just um, you know, the, things are. Um, you know, we definitely have systems in place, and we have ways of of going about things, and things become very. Um, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to say is when you go to a place like Tanzania and they uh, they they don't have the built in institutions that we have and the framework that's built. Um, does that become a place where uh, real innovation can happen because they are so outside of the, um, uh, you know, the, the standard way of doing things? Well, yes and no. I mean, they definitely they aren't going to, you know, the alternative medicine and the traditional things are still kind of outside. So they definitely have hospitals and schools that, that follow um, this, this, I won't say just the Western world, but the civilized, you know, um, more literary world. They, they are plugged into that literature and they are scientific. Um, They're they're very hardworking, Um, but they do have to um, improvise in some areas where they don't have, the same technology available or the same instruments. So when we go there, we, we have two real challenges. One of them is that the diseases are so advanced because people wait so long before they come in. And then they don't have, we don't have the same instruments and, and tools that we have here. So we have to think of different ways to, to do an operation, say. Um, so to that extent, there, there's impro- improvisation. The other thing is in their, they're developing at this one hospital I have, they're developing their own medical res, uh, record system, and they're not using one of the systems back in from our country, which most of the doctors I know in the U.S. feel really tremendously um, hemmed in and overburdened by the electronic record systems in the United States. But their system, they've developed it for their needs, and they've kind of looked at some of the things we don't have. And they have, for example, a system where patients can pay their bills with their smartphones because almost everybody has a smartphone. Even if you don't have electricity, you can – somebody down the street has a pedal-powered battery charger that will charge it up for you. And uh, rather than carrying money around or writing checks, they do all their payment with the phone. So that's hooked into the hospital system. And the interesting thing is that one of the problems they have we don't is that say a patient needs a certain blood test. And so you go to the lab to get the blood test and they say, well, we can't do that today because we're out of the chemicals to do it. So what happens is that before they pay for the lab, which you have to pay in advance, they get the message that, oh, you can't have it today. So they don't spend their money. I, I, I mean, does that make sense what I'm saying? They, they're, they are, you know, they're doing things to solve the problems that they have. Um, but in terms of medical care and how things are managed, to a certain extent, um, the innovation that, that is coming out that's just amazing is kind of advances in some fairly high-powered science. For example, in um, Congo, where they have the Ebola epidemic, there's a new monoclonal treatment that's much more effective than others, and it was developed by a Congo doctor. And that's just incredible because in the Congo, it's war torn. They, you know, they had um, rebels that came in and burst into a hospital and and killed a Cameroonian doctor who was a um, in, who was an epidemiologist. There's all this instability and violence, and in the midst of that, there are scientists who are persevering to really come up with solutions to their problem. They're not totally dependent on. Um, the World Health Organs, although they are tremendously supported. And so the, so the work that we do is is really trying to support the the generation of doctors coming up that are going to to really um, you know be in the mainstream. And they're publishing papers where they look at, you know, what what are what are the how do these diseases that we see in the rest of the world 
manifest in Africa and what are the differences in population and and they're figuring out why certain treatments that work in the in New York might not work there and what would work better so it's uh it's really exciting to see things develop and uh, that some of these young doctors there uh, feel like they're our children and they feel like they're that we're their parents and uh, and we we have them come over here uh, we we try uh, they have all of them that we're training have been over to the United States for say a couple of weeks or a month to spend some time in American hospitals and then go back but the importance of training them in Africa is that they then they stay there and they're committed to their country. If you take someone and bring them up to another country to train them, it's very hard for them to go back, not just culturally, but then because then they're in a hospital where they can't function. Right, right. And I would imagine that the frustration and all manner of stuff comes yes, in. Exactly. Yeah. Well, the, your new book, After Kilimanjaro, uh, Dr. Sarah Whitaker, tell us about Sarah. Where does she come from? And uh, at, at what point did this character come into your life? Oh, well, she came into my life when I wrote the book. <laughs> um, as I came, no, I just imagined, I tried to imagine somebody naive to Africa coming in and then learning about it sort of the way I did, and but someone um, sort of younger in the life scale. And so Sarah Whitaker is um, a surgery resident, so she's almost in her last year of surgical training and she's really burned out. You know the um, constraints of the sy- medical system here, um, the long hours, and she finds herself losing some of her compassion for patients from time to time. And that's what's really disturbing for her. Um, and so she the, she goes to Africa to take a break here, just to kind of get away from it and to try and decompress. And um, she's engaged to be married, and it's actually her fiance that, that comes up with this idea. And it, the the idea was mainly let's just go do something crazy, and he wanted to climb Kilimanjaro, so let's go to that country. And so she, but then his funding, run, you know, doesn't come through. So she goes over by herself. So she's going into this place she doesn't know. It wasn't her idea in the first place. And uh, what's she going to do with herself when she gets there? So that's the beginning of the story. And uh, she makes some friends there and learns about what's needed and uh, decides to, to do something to help. So you uh, you start thinking about her and the scenario. Um, what was the uh, – how long did it take for, for there to, to be a plot, uh, you know, that come together? And how did the book start sta- taking shape after you had the idea for her and this, this situation to put her in? Well, my idea actually came when I was visiting one of these rural communities, and it was like, what if I had somebody come in and start training the birth attendants here? So then, so this started more from the middle of the book, and I said, well, how am I going to get her here? And then you build a story of who she is to get her there. So my, the, the original plot was somebody comes here, uh, they're up in this mountain, they have all these little adventures, and then uh, that was kind of the idea for the book. And then it, it, you kind of build on the, the beginning and the ending. I think it's funny, stories and books build from different points. I remember hearing sometime that movie, Little Miss Sunshine, started out with uh, the near the end of, of the movie scene of, of, of the girl performing, and then they went through the machinations of how do we get to that point. And so this book, started, this book sort of started in the middle, and then it built out from there, and uh and then there, then a you know kind of a love story developed in there. So there was a love interest that that, that comes in there, and then it, that's kind of really took over a large part of the story too. The uh, some of the earlier stuff that you wrote, um, you said uh, that you kind of dabbled in mystery and 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 bringing a uh, kind of a medical mystery slant um, to it. This this book is is not like that. No. Um, uh, what was uh, how did you know that this was going to be, um, you know, a story about her and not necessarily take on the trappings of, you know, you know like a, a medical mystery or a, a murder mystery? Um, was that ever a thought uh, in in you know getting to know Sarah and her story? 
No, I, I it, that didn't. It, it, funny, it never crossed my mind. Even though you know, psychological thrillers and medical mysteries are all very popular, it, I just felt like I wanted to tell a story of uh, of the country. I wanted to share with people um, what a beautiful country it is, and uh, you know that the people there are, are people like us. That all around the world, most people want the same things. Um, and that they, you know, they want their families uh, to be safe. They want to have health. And depending on where you're plunked down in the world, um, you've got a different hand of cards to play. Um, the book definitely uh, uh, feels like, and I, I've never been to the continent of Africa, and, and uh, I've never been to Tanzania, but I feel like I, I, I have a... Um, I have a love for the place and the people after reading your book. Um, I, I feel very affectionate toward this piece of the world that I've never seen before. Um, the the uh, the place almost becomes a character, and I love it when uh, when an, an author is able to bring authenticity to this place, so that I I have those feelings of connection uh, by the end of the book. Were, were there any things? that you did in particular to make sure you anchored this so well into the place that it takes place in? Oh, I, you, you made me feel very happy. <laughs> like I wanted to describe the physical beauty. I wanted to describe the diversity, and I wanted to um, show the courage of the people there. Um, and, and I wanted to show the different personalities. For, for example, um, the young African uh, doctor is – very much modeled on uh, a, a young woman I know there who's a, an orthopedic surgeon who is, um, you know, very outgoing, brilliant, can speak multiple languages. Um, so she was a character that uh, it, it's not – she's not exactly the character in the book. The character in the book, I you know, made her a Maasai rather than uh, of, of a – you know, which it, my friend is not, and uh, she doesn't know <laughs> right now that that she was a uh, an inspiration to me. But I think she probably feels it when she when she reads the book. Um, yeah. So I just thought it, as much as I could do with the uh, with the visuals, um, with uh, you know little things like you know you can still send out for pizza there, so you can still get pizza there. Um, you don't really go to a movie. Um, and, and I had her um, had them go on a safari to show some of the, the wildlife. It was um, kind of trying to put up, put those things in there without turning it into a, a travelogue. We give people a be in certain spots. Um, what do you think the difference, uh, Gail, is in After Kilimanjaro and the books that you worked on previously? What was it about this story? that you were able to see it through to the end? Oh, well, you know, I have more time <laughs> since I retired. So that's part of it. But I, I just felt like such a pressure to, to tell that story. It wasn't just like, I'm going to write a book. What am I going to write a book about? It's I've got this things, these things I need to share. Yeah. It was, it was the, the urgency of the, of the story and the characters themselves that, that needed to, to be told. Yes. Gotcha. Um, were there any things that you learned about the creative process, about uh, about storytelling in the writing of this book, um, things that you picked up along the way that will make a follow-up project easier for you? Absolutely. Um, I joined an online writing group, which was called The Right Practice, so that um, – you would every week you send in some piece that you've written on and three people critique it and they send it back. And then they have short story contests uh, a couple of times a year. And I actually placed well in uh, a couple of those contests writing short stories. So you would write it, you'd get critiqued. Uh, they'd have the contest and then you'd get critiqued from the judges. And, and so um, I learned a lot by getting feedback from peers. I also um, spent time, you know, reading different books for advice on on how to write. Um, started going to some writing conferences, so my writing was a lot better at the beginning than than it was uh, at the end. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, do you? Um, what do you do when when you have a writing group or a critique partner? 
um, who who doesn't get uh, it uh, and it in the in kind of the big sense. Um, did you ever get feedback from someone and and you told yourself no that's I'm I'm going to stick with with my original intent? Like uh, was there ever a time when when someone's advice did not help the book? Yeah, it was the one time I paid a professional editor to. <laughs> To look at the first couple of chapters just to um, get some, um, I wanted to, to, you know, get some feedback. And, and I wanted to get an audition to see if I would want her to edit the whole book. And I, mm, no, because the first thing she said, well, why do you have this start on the, the plane? Because there's no reason for her to this other than maybe meeting somebody. And I'm thinking, she doesn't get it. Here, this the, Being on an airplane is one of the, and having a medical emergency is one of the, worst things for a doctor because you don't have the things that you need and that was symbolic of what she was jumping into going into africa where she went so that was one thing she said and i had a line in there with one of the flight attendants asks her uh you know says oh a lady doctor and and she kind of said that's ridiculous that would never happen and and i I went ahead and changed it but i shouldn't have because that kind of stuff still happens all the time you know the, the flight attendants will you know, I've heard friends of mine say uh, they went up to volunteer and they had this, um, you know, EMT that was a tall male that they said, oh, no, this is fine. We've got, you know, we'll take him. <laughs> and really, you know, uh, I've been on planes for emergencies a few times. And, and so everything I described with that really happened in, in, in amalgamations. But it's really things that... It, it really stresses you as a, as a physician or a nurse or any kind of medical person. And, you know, encountering a medical problem in a situation where you're uncomfortable is really scary. And it's a, you know, it's a parable for what happens when you go do medical outreach in some other country. When, when someone finishes this book, Gail, uh, and they, they close that back cover, what do you hope they're left with? Um. Well, wanting to read more, obviously. Uh, I want them to, to feel like they've uh, taken a trip to Africa and gotten to know a part of the world they didn't know. I want them to, maybe if, if they haven't met other people in other countries, feel like they get more of a sense of global community, realizing that, you know, somebody that, you know, lives on a hillside in a in a hut with no running water and no electricity um has the same, you know, kind of wishes and, and hopes for their families. Uh, that's the kind of thing I would hope people ca- would carry away. Well, the book After Kilimanjaro is out everywhere now and paperback and Kindle edition. Um, Gail, I am recommending this book to all sorts of people, and I, I think it would make a fantastic Christmas present uh, since we're in that part of the year now. Uh, this would be a great book for people to buy several copies of and give out as gifts this year. Well, I'm happy to hear that. Yeah, for sure. Um, if people are just learning about you and want to learn more about what you do and the book, is there a place where they can connect with you online? Yes, I have a, a website, uh, gailwoodson.com. It's got links to some of the short stories I've published and a little bit about what we do in Africa. And then I have a little blog. Um, I've also got a, a, a Facebook, an author Facebook page. Excellent. We'll put links to all of that in the show notes of this episode and a link to the book where you can buy a copy. Uh, Gail, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show with me today. Well, thanks for talking to me. I really enjoyed it. Now stay tuned for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. The brutes of the Andersonville Prison Hospital have moved me to the dead room, or so it has come to be known. None so domiciled have yet left this place. We receive only the smallest rations and only cursory care to reduce our odors and spare the nostrils of our keepers. The good Christians of the Confederacy do not see any need to provide comfort to those who will soon sleep soundly enough underground. You must know, at least, how your father came to such an end. At Doctortown, Kilpatrick entrusted me with the conquest of a railroad trestle and my bummers, my demolition team, acquitted themselves admirably thanks to my ingenuity with powder. We successfully destroyed the trestle work past Morgan's Lake. This would prove to be my entire contribution to the war. 
Federal troops were unable to capture the bridge or overcome the enemy's battery. Kilpatrick withdrew, and my bummers and I found ourselves on the wrong side of the Altamaha River, behind the enemy line with no hope of reaching our encampment. Rebels accosted us, taking our remaining supplies. We escaped and headed south, hoping by a long march to reach Seymour's forces in Jacksonville, but we encountered other rebel encampments at Jessup. Four of my men were lost to gunfire. We marched west, then south again, barely evading capture. We had no choice but to brave the great swamp Okefenoki. Oh, on and on it goes, in every direction, endlessly. We trudged through miles of grasping mud and noxious rot, pursued by hunger and the mosquito, scratching at our arms and faces until all our skin was scourged. We lived off alligator meat at first, then nothing at all. My men grew mutinous, blamed me for all their misfortunes, threatened to throw me in a sack, weigh me down with stones, and sink my body. Yet was I not equally hungry? Did I not starve? I grew weary of their endless insubordination and contempt. Finally, they took hold of me and swore they would hang me by the neck for leading them to ruin. They were five in number, younger than I and more muscular. I was no match for them physically. They lay their hands on me and I burned them. I burned those men. The flame rose from me as from a volcano, stripping the skin from those boys, blackening their faces, roasting their flesh. And let this be my final ghastly confession. I feasted that night, feasted on the meat of my prospective murderers. And that is how I survived. I staggered alone from that swamp, a mad thing, fueled by outrage and guilt. I saw an encampment of rebel soldiers and surrendered myself gladly. They say in Andersonville prison all men are brothers, equal in filth equal in terror, equal in ruin. Yet I feel I may claim some small distinction, at least, for I am surely damned to a greater extent than any here. <laughs>